I'm going to speak to you about five open source security tools I think that all developers should know about. So first thing first, most of the developers that I know doesn't really care about security, at least not the first thing, right? So when they say about if their code is secured, most of the time they say, not me, I don't know how, or something else doesn't really relevant. And so why does developers need to know about security tools? So, hi, my name is Ran. I am a developer team leader at JIT. It's a product security company based in Israel, a startup, we're still very small. Um, I'm, I have 10 years of experience in managing rules. I started at the IDF in a unit A200. It's similar to the American NSO. Um, I was there for seven years. Then I joined a cybersecurity startup. I was the first employee and one of the forming team mem members. Uh, called BDEM, they were acquired a year ago by Dato. And then I took my backend skills to the limit, I moved to AppsFlyer, if you know it. It's also Israel, but it's already 10 years old. And they're doing mobile management, my team was responsible for 100 billion events a day. And even though I come from some cyber security background, I consider myself as a backend engineer, I was mostly in infrastructure and middleware. And even myself didn't think about security for first. Thinking about performance, functionality, user experience, even cost, and only then about security. So I joined JIT to help all developers know security better. And I will show you what you're doing at, at the end. But first, wait, coming down. I'll discuss to you about all the five uh, security tools. Why do I think that all developers should know about them? Why do you need to secure? How to choose the right tool? And a demo, if you last till the end, I will show also what JIT is doing with all those security tools. Great, okay, so why? So we believe in a term, it's a relatively new term called minimum viable, minimum viable security, like you have minimum viable product, probably you all know about it. So we think that like the product, it should be also in security. You have to start early. Don't wait for a breach to happen or for the CISO to come and start asking questions or for the company to have to, to do some compilant like SOC2 and things like that. You have to start as early as you can and shift left. So I'm sorry, I've heard it a lot of time in this convention. So I think that this is the future for developers. I mean, up until years ago, developers needed dev teams, uh, DevOps teams sorry, to do to start servers, to do a lot of ops operation. Now they can do it by themselves. They can raise lambdas, servers, whatever they need. Also in QA, they, need, they can create end-to-end -end tests by themselves. So I think the next thing is security. There are a lot of companies in the recent years that are starting to do this shift and give the developers the power to, sec to secure their code. So with a lot of power comes a lot of overhead. So <laughs> they have to do it iteratively iteratively, not doing all at once. Let's say they didn't start early and the, program, the project program is running for years. If they want to do it now more secure, it can take them a lot of months to do it. So we're talking about doing it iteratively. Next thing is why do you need to secure? So those are just a few of the categories you need to secure. You need to secure your data to protect from any secrets to being leaked. You have to secure your libraries you're using, the infrastructure for, co for a cloud infrastructure and everything else, your containers, and runtime scanning. So, how to choose? So I told you that in JIT, we wanna help developers use those security tools. So actually, research and invested a lot of time to research different tools in different areas, all the areas that I showed you before, and also in different languages. And I would, won't show you all the spreadsheet with all the thousands of, uh, of points, and I'll get only the three main things you have to consider. So the first term is accountability. You're searching for a dependency check for Python, start looking for an open source tool for it on the web, you get to GitHub, you see a couple of, of options. So you have to check the stars, how many forces there is there, the, how many watchers, is it owned by some, someone private or by, by a big company, even a security company? Does it have a lot of contributors? Does it qualify by OpenSSF? 
Is it maintained? Was the last update a year ago, a month ago, or days ago? And the licensing, is it really free? I mean, is it MIT, Apache? Do you need, do you have any rate limit? You get only some of the data free, but then if you want to see explanation about the, the vulnerability, you have to pay. So this is the first, first thing you have to check. Okay. Next thing up is usability. So this, this one gets even trickier because here you have all the data, you can search everything. Now you really have to try it. So try it. You can, if it's got some good documentation, you can run it locally. You can maybe use a Dockerfile to run it. Maybe it has, has some plugins to IDE or CI actions in GitHub or Jenkins. Does it configurable? Does it need files or flags to run it? Is it easy to add all those flags? And how does it output looks like? Is it a JSON file that you can handle technically? Um, is it easy to understand all the, all the parameters? Like if it found a vulnerability, does it show you what it is and explain all the details? And the last part is actually the hardest part. You have to actually run it and see the results. So you can test it on your own repos, on Goat repos. So here we have actually some cybersecurity expert, better than I am, that actually check them on, on Go triples and see if it has a lot of false positive or false negative. And does the severity level is accurate? I mean, maybe it shows everything is critical, but some of them is low. So it's also a lot of overhead to the developers. Does it have a good coverage? It can be on file types or, or maybe just more, more databases that it connects to and get more CVEs. So that's the, that was the part. And now, after we discussed about why, what, and how, let's start and deep dive to each one of them. So secret detection. OK. I'm talking a bit fast. We'll slow down. OK, so secret detection mission is to find secrets, passwords, even credit card numbers, API tokens, all kinds of th secrets that you don't want to get to the web. So, by the raise of hand, who knows someone else that pushed a secret to GitHub? Someone else, not you. OK. <laughs> so it happens all the time. Not to me, of course. Someone I know. And we checked three different tools for secret detection. So we checked GitLeaks. Actually, a couple of days ago, we announced that it's going to be a company. It was by Zachary Smith. And it's going to be GitLeaks uh, company. Uh, so I updated. It, we checked Detect Secrets by Yelp and Git Secrets by AWS. All are great tools. And we did all the checks that we talked about. And we decided to go with GitLeaks. It gave you the page from GitHub. You can see it has a lot of watching and forks and so many stars. And it was updated a couple of weeks ago. You can run it all so many app options. I mean, directly for your computer. It has the CI action. I actually think that now the CI action you have to pay for, now that it became a company. But you can still run it free uh, locally and in Dockerfile. Um, it has a good config file that you can add more rules, more regex, if you have secrets that you know how they look like. It's very accurate. We saw that it found a lot of our secret in our growth repos, not the real secrets. Of course, we don't have them. Um, it runs all, all multi, on all file types with, that we checked. It can be a text file, it can be Python file, Terraform files, everything. And it found a lot of secrets from different types. I mean, AWS account keys, GitHub account keys, all sorts of secrets. So I'll show you just an example of how it looks like. So this is an access key for AWS. And if you run it, simply writing the, the command at the, the top, you, it founds the secret and it also tells you the rule type. So this one is AWS access token. Great. Okay, the second category is dependency check. So what's the mission? To detect open source component with known vulnerabilities. Even it's the first packages they use or even deeper packages that they use themselves. So we checked here specifically for Python. We are design partner zero for our company. So we were writing Python, so we checked on Python. And we checked safety by PyApp, Jake by Sonatype, and a dependency check of OWASP. All were very good. And we chose OWASP. 
also it's very, very common tool to use. It's also uh, passing the uh, OpenSSF. It's very updated, updated probably 12 days ago since I took the screenshot. And you can run it also in Dockerfile from the terminal. It has a Jenkins plugin. I put it in purple because I don't want to put it in red so you don't think it's vulnerability. <laughs> but uh, uh, not such a good thing. It doesn't find the dependency tree. So for Python, it doesn't really matter. But the dependency check also can run on Node and on, on Golang. And they, they can find you a, a, a library that you use deeper, but it doesn't show you the tree of what was the first external library that you used. So you have to use some other tools to get the tree and tend to cross between the, the results. Um, it's very accurate. It checks the vulnerabilities both in NVD data and OSS index. It runs for Python. It runs actually not only on the requests, uh, requirements, sorry. Also runs on zip file or metadata file, other places that can have Python dependencies. And it runs, as I said, on multiple languages and not only Python. Some of them are actually are in experimental mode. So actually for Go, we choose Nancy. And I won't discuss about it, but it's such a cute logo, so I put it here. Um, so yeah, you have to really check for each language that you use if it's good for it or not. For Python, we found out that yes, but not, not so for other languages. It depends. And they keep processing it and keep updating it. We will see updates all the time. OK, so an example, I have this big requirements file with only one library, requests. And you see all the output, but I'll zoom in. Um, so it found that it has a vulnerability inside it. It tells you the CVE from OSS index. And it even gets a score. And what happens with this package? Actually, this one sums it up. Insufficiently protected credentials. And you can even go to the site and get more data from OSS index and for more site. Point number three, infrastructure misconfiguration. So what's the mission here? So we want to detect misconfiguration in infrastructure as code before it hits the sky, reach the cloud. It can be mis missing encryption, too broad permissions. Maybe you're not logging, which is actually essential in security, or not using other mandatory uh, things you should use. You have some default ports or any other default values that you shouldn't use. Let's take the picture. It helps me to slow down, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, so we checked TFSEC by Aqua, Kix by Checkmarks, and Chekhov by Palo Alto. I think all have a, a booth here upstairs. All were very, very good tools, and it was really hard to choose. We go with Kix after a lot of testing. Um, also, very, very um, strong tool by, by uh, Checkmarks. Very updatable, stars and everything. And it can run on multiple file types. It runs on Terraform files for the AWS, CloudFormation JSONs, uh, for Azure and, uh, and uh, Google Cloud as well. It has powerful queries, I think more than 2,000 queries. You can see on the website that it runs and scan and check if there is a vulnerability in your code. Uh, it does a uh, nightly build, so it can get updates all the time. And the known file scan is actually a line from their output. So Usually, when you run it, you get a JSON file with all the data and all the vulnerabilities, even if it didn't find anything. But if there weren't files to scan, meaning there were JSON files, but non-CloudFormation JSON, it gets you a text file with this output. So it's not the only case. There are some kind of cases when it not gets you the output you're looking for. So you have to handle it yourself. And here's an example. So this is Amazon Elastic Block Store, and this is the config for it. And I'll zoom in. It found you the, the severity, medium, uh, medium level. And it's essential to use as encryption, and it's not enabled. I want to add something else. Compared to, to Chekhov, which was also good, and also gave us a lot of result, Chekhov didn't give us the severity level. And this can be very overwhelming to get 2,000 vulnerabilities without any severity level. You don't know which one are more critical than the others. 
So this is one of the reasons that we choose Kicks and not Checkout. But both have very good false positive and false negative uh, scores. OK, container scanning. So the mission to find vulnerabilities in your container's images in the Docker files. So we tested Trivi by Aqua, Claire, and Encore. And we chose to go with Trivi. Also, they have a boot upstairs, I think, of uh, Aqua. Also, a lot of stars and forks, and it's very updatable. Maintainable. And it's very, very easy to use. You straight out of the box. It's very accurate. It runs with multiple OS uh, packages if your Docker file runs in different uh, packages. And it also detects secrets and infrastructures as code vulnerability. So, why is this line in purple? Because for Trivi, it's good. It does a lot of things. But actually, it is better for Docker files. And we use the other tools for secrets and for infrastructure as code. So if we use Trivi as it is, we will get actually duplicated findings and vulnerabilities from, from all the tools. So you have to configure what you want to get from each tool, if it is configurable. So I didn't add the Docker file, but I ran it on, on a Docker. It found three uh, vulnerabilities. Two of them is because buffer overflow uh, because of a long path name. And the last one is runtime. So runtime scanning, you will need to check your web application, even your APIs, while they're live up and running. It's also called Dust. So we checked between Zap by OWASP Foundation, Nikto, and Arkini. I think actually they are already deprecated. And Zap is a well-known tool. I hope you already know, have heard about it. I think it's running for 12 years now. And it's very, I mean, gets a lot of releases, a lot of contributors, passes the open OS, OSSF, open SSF. It can be run in two types, full scan Docker. You can actually install it, install it as an application, and it has a UI, and you can figure out everything. It's very, very ex extensible. So, it's got a marketplace. It's got a lot of plugins. So if you want to deep dive in it, there is a lot of work you should do to add more plugins and to use it better. And it's very accurate. It has a lot of feature. It checks for SQL injection, broken access, cross-site scripting. Fuzz it does fuzzing, authorized and unauthorized access. So many, many tools and many things it can check. Okay, so here is just an example of finding that, that it found. Um, the content security policy, the header is not set, and it explains you the reason why it's a problem. It gets a risk score. I don't know why it's both low and medium. Okay, so I'll show you a, a quick demo of using only four of the tools, the first one and what can go wrong. Oops. Okay, so here I have my repo, it's public, and it's got a Terraform file. I'm using DynamoDB. I have here a Docker file with some passwords in it. We've got a Python file to run everything. And a requirements with some vulnerabilities. OK. So I just configured a GitHub workflow called it Security YAML. And you can see here, I will zoom in. OK. So I just wrote all the tools that we discussed about. It runs parallelly in different jobs. So Secret detection, this is all it has to take in order to run. Actually, it runs only on the last commit, unlike the others, which checks all your different branch. I'll discuss about it later. And dependency check, so this is OWASP dependency check, and everything 
you have to pass it in order to run. So this is for running on Python. Okay. Infrastructure as code. This is Kicks running on the Terraform file. Told you it can run also in other file JSONs and a lot of things. They actually also added option to run on Docker, so need to check it again compared to Trivi. Uh, but still, we're using Trivi for checking containers. And that's about it. Okay. So, I will add a GitHub token, because I love secrets. Saved it here. And I'll create a new branch. Okay. So this is actually pushed my my changes. I don't have to create a pull request. And it started to run all the tools. We can go in. In the meanwhile, we'll create a pull request. Okay. So this is the secret scanner by Gitlix. So you can see how it works. And it found, leak was found. It tells you the rule. It found out that it's GitHub password. This is just the regex for how GitHub secrets looks like. JHF and numbers. Okay, dependency check finished. Okay. So you can see it found, it ran a lot of checks, and it tells you that it found the CVE. You can go to the report also to find it. Finish really by the order. And this is Kicks, and it found a lot of things of different severities. IAM access analyzer not enabled, F3 bucket logging disabled, and higher severities Dynamo table not encrypted, MFA delete. So you can see it found a lot of things. Too high severities, it gets you a conclusion at the end. And last one, it's still running. Okay, so part of the problem that some of them can actually take long time. Actually, I'm surprised it's trivial. Usually it's more kicks because it reaches database to get information and also dependency check, it needs to be updated all the time. And but let's give trivia some chance. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so it took time because it needs to update the DB every once in a while. And it downloaded the DB. And it found four, uh, four high, sorry, um, vulnerabilities. And it explains you the reason why. So me. Okay. So I'll go back to the slides. Okay, so I show you how to run everything and we discussed about some difficult difficulties that we have with them. I mean, not all of them, most of them are pretty accurate, but you have to add some takes time, some have different output files, so you have to handle each one of them and see how to use it. I s still recommend if you're not using any of them and you're using Python or any other uh, tool that we discussed, 
to try and see it for yourself, to just add in and see if it finds vulnerabilities. Another issue is unlike Git leaks, they run on all the default branch and find all the findings since day one. And it also can be very overwhelming to the developer to just write his small PR. I didn't want to see all the other files that he didn't touch. So Widget actually want to do an orchestration of those tools and to help you use them very easy and much faster. And those are some of the tools that we're running. So it goes for different languages and different technologies. Proler, for example, is for running checks checks to your AWS, cl sorry, AWS cloud. Uh, SEMgrep is for static analysis for uh, JavaScript. Bandit is static analysis for Python. GoSec for Go. We discussed about the cute uh, logo of Nancy. And, sorry. <laughs> and we also added branch protection, checking your branches at GitHub to see if you enabled branch protection and more other uh, tools that we're using uh, ourselves. And I'll show you our tool in a minute, but these are some screenshots. Let's just see them. Okay. Okay, so I already enabled a plan. Let me zoom in. So I want to check on my assets. I want to check uh, static analysis, dependency checks, secrets, containers, and infrastructure as code. You have service catalog to add more tools. You can see by plans, if it's SOC 2 or OASP serverless top 10, by categories, and you can add more tools and more features. Some of them, we're still in beta mode, by the way. So some of them are not, uh, are not enabled, but you can use most of them. And I already committed the plan, and I already added my, my repos. So these are all the, the vulnerabilities I already, already had on my default branches. So we do think that in, in these pages, not every developer will go and look inside, because this is more for a security champion that want to go deeper and find old vulnerabilities and he can decide what to do with them to assign them to a team or to a person. But once someone created a PR, so this is for the developer, we're actually telling him where he added this time a secret, where he added vulnerability, and we show it as, as a comment in, on the PR. And if he merge it anyway, it depends if they enabled branch protection by us or not. So only then it will go and appear here in the finding page. So I'll give it time to run. And I think I, that's it. I spoke too fast. So <laughs> you have two, 10 more minutes for questions or for a break. You don't have to, go to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. JIT, okay. yeah, <laughs> like just in time. Just in time, got it. Um, is it doing any sort of deduplication uh, if it finds multiple, multiple findings of the same type? Okay, the from different tools? Yes. Okay, so yes, so we're actually checking what the file extensions that were changed in the PR, and we only run on Docker file Trivi, and on CloudFormation files, and Terraform files, kicks. So this way we won't get duplications. Kicks, I mean, Tools get upgrades all the time, so Kick started also telling about secrets in the Terraform, so we now do have duplicates on that, but we, we are going to fix it soon, and then we'll do, do, dedupe them as well. Thanks. So yeah. Um, and do you have a, oh, sorry. Uh, do you Go ahead. Have, um, is there a way to customize any of the, the, the severity levels because the, 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 it can be specific to your environment? Good question. I didn't talk about it. Okay, so another thing that we, we believe in, it's 
security S code and plan S code. So actually, when I installed JIT, it actually created this repo on my organization. And this is the only repo we have access to. We actually, all the checks are running on the client and we're not reading his files and can access his files. So here you can actually define your plan as code and you don't have to do it from the plan page. And also the same security YAML you can define here with other parameters to run. You can change it for yourself. Uh, but these are our default recommendation how to, to run this one is for Bandit, for Python scan ch checking. And as I told you about, um, sorry, the secret detection. So we run it like this, and this actually gives us not only the last commit, but all the changes in the PR, uh, which is, it's really dependent. It helps us to get all the changes. Um, so yes, thank you for the question. <laughs> any questions about the tool? I didn't manage to be mostly on, on JIT, so if you have any questions about the tool themselves, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so actually we try to, to check between severity levels between different tools. We don't know about if the, we, we can't tell about every vulnerability if it's false positive or negative when it runs on your, on your machine. But we do try to normalize all the severity levels. But yeah, if the tool is having false positive or false negative, we don't change it. Oh. So they can actually ignore it, either from the PR, so I already merged it, but you can actually ignore the finding. We want to add more ignore types, like ignore all the tests or ignore all the, all the folder, and you can also ignore it as a security champion after it reached the default uh, branch. You can, oh, here you go, those are the last one. You can actually also uh, ignore it from here. Answer the question? Yes, and that, that, that persists over multiple scans of that same process. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it really depends. We want to add more types of, of ignore rules. So it's ignoring a fingerprint, and it can ignore in the future types. I mean, the test ID, the, each, each test has a different ID. Or let's say you have a test folder in your repo, and you want there are a lot of dummy secrets in there, and you don't want to text this, this uh, folder. So yes. Questions? Yeah. Making your presentation, I saw the review of the different tools. Will you make the presentation available? Um, I have to check. I don't see why not, but yeah. Yeah, I, I looked at your presentation wasn't on the schedule, I think, so it would be great to see it available. Okay. So it's, it's not an open source, but it's in a public beta, free beta. We just announced it like uh, two weeks ago, and we got out of stealth mode. And we do want some part of the code to be open source in the future, all the, the way to wrap a tool and to handle its out, the different outputs. So we do want it to be in the future open source. And, but we do have a, actually, we work with Gitleaks, and we sponsor them, and they also use us for themselves in Go. Good question. So actually, this is my team responsibility. So we now only have like a simple copy, a way to copy the, the sorry, all the fields, and you can copy multiple findings. But it copies them in a way that you can actually paste it on Jira, and it gets us all the fields. We want to do better integration with all ticket uh, providers, like Jira, Shortcut, and things like that. And yes, we're now started to work about remediation. Uh, first from dependency check, that's the easiest part, and we moved on to start looking at, uh, at the infrastructure as code, and infrastructure misconfiguration remediation. Still working on it, so if you have any ideas, we wanna do it actually, I hope to do it from the PR, it will send you a suggestion, and you just click on the suggestion and you, it will change, but 
Some of them actually dependencies check. We want to run it scheduling. So I mean, maybe once you merge your code, it wasn't uh, there wasn't a vulnerability, and then something was found, or a deeper uh, deeper library was changed. So actually, we need to run dependency check every week or every day, um, and you might find something afterwards. So yeah. Yes, yeah, so all the AppSec tools on GitHub run on the client environment. And other things like Prolar that runs on the AWS cloud, we run it from our Fargate machine. Okay. Yeah. But the results are consumed by your cloud tools. Sorry? The, the, results, uh, the results of the tools are then consumed by your cloud Yeah, tools. exactly. Okay. Good questions. I'll add them to the slides afterwards. That raises another question. If I was working in an air gap environment, how would, I, would there be any way to upload the information later? Um, if, the, if the scripts are all run locally and I can connect to like a local repo, can we run this locally as well? Is there any way to do that? If you can run JIT locally, you mean? Yeah, I mean, just putting all these tools together, trying to think of this, this as a full orchestration of like, what can I do quickly if I'm in an air gap environment where I don't have a whole lot of access to get out? Is there any possibility? So we don't have it now. Okay. We'll think about it. <laughs> Good idea. OK. So thank you all. And before time, so we have four more minutes to drink coffee. <laughs> so thank you.